So, hello. My name is Samantha Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian as well as the kinesiology and public health librarian for UNCG University Libraries. UNCG Libraries came up with the idea to create a series of webinars for the UNCG community on research and applications. This is the sixth webinar for the series, and welcome. In this series, different librarians will cover topics on UNCG library resources and research tools. These 30-minute webinars will be recorded in WebEx Meeting Center, where we are now, and placed on the library webpage through YouTube, where they will be closed captioned um, and not have participant data available for the public. So I am going to put that website into chat for everyone to see. And um, it also will um, contain other applicable links and presentation material when applicable. So um, let me just quickly cover some logistical things about how this webinar will run. So um, please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red, but feel free to turn your audio back on by clicking the audio icon again at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with the presenter. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate on chat. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please put them in chat and um, I will monitor them throughout. If there's technical issues throughout the presentation, feel free to call me or email me, and I'm putting that information into the chat right now, um, and I'll try to guide you through some solutions. I'm also gonna be on Gchat in the background um, with my audio muted, so don't worry about that, Linda. Um, worst case scenario, remember that this session is being recorded. So before I introduce myself, does anyone have any questions? Okay, so this um, session is on research data management as, and is being presented by Linda Kellum, who has many roles at our library. And um, again, remember it will be recorded, but um, I'm gonna pass it off to Linda. Okay, here it comes, Linda. Okay, sounds good. All right, so you should be seeing my slides. Make sure everything's good. And y'all can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is Linda Kellum, and I am the Social Science Sciences Data Librarian um, at the University Libraries. Um, and uh, just to give you an overview of what we're going to do today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about what is data management, um, why we need data, man data management, how does this fit into the research life cycle, and then what is uh, DMP, or what is the DMP. Um, this is a really short session, so we're going to stay at a high level on this, these topics. Um, uh, but keep in mind, each of these topics do have disciplinary approaches and approaches from different perspectives. Um, and it can be hard at some time that points to bridge those disciplinary gaps. Um, I will approach this mostly from a librarian's point of view, um, of course, and then um, I'll explain what that is a little bit later, but also from my disciplines, which are political science and history. Um, the survey indicated that a few people had um, specific concerns, and at the end we can talk about those if they, if they came today. Um, but I, you're, I'm happy to have anybody come and talk to me or make an appointment and uh, work with me one-on-one -on, -one on any specific issues they run into. And one note what I'll make about this is that when I use the word data, I'm not just referring to numeric and quantitative files. Um, pretty much all of the files, print, digital, um, any kind of files that are necessary for the research um, to make sense and uh, that is arranged in some kind of systematic way is part of the, the data uh, environment and um, should be managed appropriately. And I would also say sometimes I think researchers, when they hear this term data management, they think of grants only, um, but this is not a topic just for grants. It is for anybody who um, is doing research of any kind. So last week was Love Data Week. Um, they do this every February. Uh, the data community does it in February. Um, and the theme was data stories. So to understand why I'm giving this webinar and why I got interested in this, it might be helpful to know a little bit about, about my background and what I do. Um, I'm a political scientist by training. 
My master's research looked at qual uh, or combined qualitative and quantitative research um, to examine women and human, human rights organizations in Croatia um, and their role in na building national identity after the fall of Yugoslavia. Um, so I have a mixed methods approach um, going into this originally. I decided to take a break from research and got my MOS in 2007. And, be um, and because my skill set, uh, I became the first data librarian here at UNCG, which was initially meant to support data discovery, so helping people find data sets to analyze, do secondary data analysis on. Analysis on. Um, and that expanded into data management after the 2013 mandate. My current research interests are, um, I'm actually a PhD student in history, and I'm focusing on the intersection of social science methods and digital humanities. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is looking at how we can um, bridge that gap and, and thinking about using social science methods to analyze historical uh, documents. Um, so my background is pretty varied, uh, I, I, um, and I think that allows me to talk to various groups across um, a lot of dis disciplines about these kinds of issues. Um, and it gives it a little bit different perspective, but we'll all be coming from our own perspective and our own discipline when it comes to our data. So in terms of definitions and thinking about what is data management, um, this term became really popular in 2011 uh, because of the granting agency requirement, especially NSF's requirement, that grant proposals had to come with a DMP, a DMP, a data management plan, had to be submitted along with the proposal. Um, and I don't think we've defined this term well enough probably over the past few years. Um, sometimes it's thrown out there with assumption of what it means. And uh, most of the literature, the data management itself is focusing on technical processing and the preparation of data for analysis. Um, and that, that, can be, that sounds very specific, and I actually think it's a little bit broader than that. That's just one definition. I think it can go a little bit broader um, to also encompass the planning for that processing and preparation. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I'll be talking about today is that um, the planning process. On one level, that technical processing is a very discipline-specific activity. It depends on the types of data collection that you're doing, if you're doing qualitative or quantitative data collection, the types of tools you're using, if you're using R or NIMVIVO or REDCap or something like that. And then disciplinary best practices, so lab notebooks, of course, in the sciences, and um, other kinds of uh, practices you might see in your own disciplines. Um, so because of that, that, data met, that technical processing um, can get very detailed uh, and very specific to the discipline you're in. And, and a lot of the, the information about data management will actually stay at a higher level, kind of getting pre best practices for this process rather than getting into those disciplinary specific um, aspects as much. Some of the, there are some resources that do that, though. At the same time, there's certainly, um, or like I say, there's definitely um, best practices and principles, and that's mostly what we're going to focus on today. Um, there's also data curation, so this is the process of selecting um, data for preservation. Not all data has to be preserved or should be preserved for the long term. Um, and so it's really thinking through the process of, or thinking through what is necessary for preservation, what is the most highly valuable um, data that you've collected. And again, this has disciplinary, disciplinary implications, um, and it can depend on the discipline you're in or whether or not something should be saved um, and preserved for the long term. So why do we need data management? Um, well, for many reasons. Um, this list is just a few of the reasons that, uh, of things that can happen um, to the data. I was curious, I know Sam, you're going to run the questions, but I was curious if y'all had any, if the participants had any situations where they've run into this kind of, could I do a poll? Is that possible? Yeah, you can do a poll through WebEx or whatever. Oh, not a real poll, but just ask if y'all have, y'all run into any of these situations, Beth and Matt, where you've lost data for a particular data loss or, or storage failure or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it happens to everyone. I um, Format ob obsolescence always gets me. Uh, I actually, my master's degree was in, um, or master's, my master's thesis was in uh, the format that I still have available that's manipulable was in uh, a Microsoft Works format that was not, um, 
I couldn't open it in Microsoft Word, and so I was <laughs> you'd run into those problems where you're trying to use this file from many years ago or several years ago, and it's not necessarily backwards compatible what we use now. Um, yeah, changes in years to your expectations, format, human error, definitely bigger, a big issue as well. Um, so these are the three, these are the reasons why we're promoting this, not just because the grant agencies require us to do this, but because the, you're going to we lose data, we collect so much data that there, it's inevitable that some of it's going to get lost. And so if we think strategically about how to manage it when we're going through the process of collecting, it will help um, deal with these kinds of issues. Um, so when it comes to this need, uh, our data management and the research lifecycle. As a librarian, I tend to think about the, the, the research life cycle, or the, what this is called, the research data curation life cycle. Um, because of the fact that in the end, I would like data or the research outputs to be shared, all right? I want to make things available to other people. And so in my case, it, um, if I want it to be something that can be shareable for other people, um, the data has to be collected in a way to, and, well, and documented in such a way that it can be shared later on. Um, so if, it, it, if data is not collected or documented correctly or appropriately, then it won't be something that can actually be archived or shareable with others at the end. Um, so ultimately, that, that's my goal is to try and encourage people to, uh, to think strategically about how other people might be um, approaching this data and whether or not it will be usable for them in the end. This doesn't mean every all data should be shared, but at least thinking strategically about whether or not you will want to or have to share it at some point. Um, in this presentation, because of the time constraints, I'm going to focus mainly on the data management plan, um, but we do think about all aspects of this um, cycle. And certainly, the, this is not just a library thing. Uh, data storage is a, is a, a tremendous um, question. I know a couple of people in the survey who, who brought that up. Um, and that's something that really involves both the library and IT, right? It's something that it involves a lot of different people or different players on our campus. With students, it's something that uh, graduate students, that's a question that I don't think a lot of them think strategically about. Uh, and so we talk about that in the presentations that I do with graduate students. Um, so when it comes to a data management plan, um, in 2011, this became a really hot topic because of the National Science Foundation's requirement that grant proposals include a data management plan. Um, those plans needed to address two general questions. One, what are your data? And two, what is your plan for managing that data? It's a written formal document um, that outlines what you will do with your data before, during, and after you complete your research. Have you all write, written one? written data management plans before if Matt and Doug? Or have you come across these before? Nope. Okay. All right, cool, awesome. Um, so I'll be going through the, the basic outlines of what this is and keep in mind that it's very similar across the different agencies. So a lot of the principles we're talking about will be the same if you are planning to write these in the future. Um, so this can be also be, I should say this is, can also be fund, unfunded projects. Um, for example, I have a data management or had a data management plan for a book that I co-edited um, that had a, a large number of authors who were um, contributing chapters. And in our case, it was a versioning plan. It was a way that the co-author and I were thinking through how we would deal with each stage of that book and the different kinds of files that we would be getting related to that book. And that in, it, it included both the, um, the actual chapter itself, those drafts, and the final product, but also some data sets that they wanted to, the participants wanted to have archived um, and made available that supported their research. Um, so we, before we even wrote the book, we sat down and talked, and she, she lives in Canada, so it was something where we had to be strategic about how we were going to uh, share files and um, name files and think about the, the different um, sharing tools that we can use. And we did this through a written plan. So this plan for data management will be something that will help you in the long run. And it's not just a document that we write to meet a requirement. It really is something that is something to help you strategically think through a project in its various stages. A well thought out plan can help ensure that your data are safe for the present and accessible well into the future. Um, both in terms of the quantitative data or qualitative data that you're collecting, but also the other kinds of files that we don't often 
that often get lost or we don't think about as much when we're thinking about data management. So these five components, the main components of the DMP, and again, these are general components. Um, you'll see each data management plan uh, requirements, or for individual agencies, the data management plan requirements may change or they may use different terminology, but overall they use the same um, components. And the first one is to articulate, it's kind of a data inventory. I think it's the university, a colleague at the University of Minnesota who uses this term, data inventory, which is actually very apt, and it's, I think, the best way to think about uh, this first stage. And this is really where you're taking a inventory of all the kinds of things that you will be creating. Um, so what is the data that you're producing? How will it be acquired? How will it be processed? What are the file formats? Um, so thinking critically about uh, how you're saving uh, your data um, and backups of your data, be it in .csv files or in .txt files. What if you're using something like REDCap? Are you outputting the data so that you actually have access to it outside of the system itself? Um, is, a, is a very important part of this. Um, how do you ensure quality assurance and control during the collection? Uh, I um, am collecting data on petitions that were sent to Congress. And I actually started out creating a little spreadsheet, which was silly of me. Um, and I realized that it would be much better if I just used something like Wasserx, even though it seemed like overkill for what I was trying to do. It actually, I could ensure that I was um, uh, uh, allowing for quality control during the process of inputting the data. And so thinking through those questions, and a lot of this is just common sense that you would want to think about when you're um, thinking about your project. What existing data will you use, and then how will the data be managed in the short term? Um, and again, all of this includes the wide variety of things that you might be collecting. So it could be observational logs, spreadsheets, lab notebooks, schematics, anything that's going to help give context for your particular um, research. Uh, some things that are less obvious, sometimes are draft of papers or extra documents, schematics. Um, so all of the, all, any kind of information that would be helpful for you in the long term. In addition to thinking through this, what is your data? It's also thinking about your backup plans. Um, we know that the large, uh, big projects have their master backups, um, but at the same time we need to be, uh, I'm not concerned about the big projects usually because they have master backups, or we assume they do, which may be a problem. Um, but thinking through how you're actually backing up your, your data, um, saving files, formats that are not proprietary, and then also the 3 2, one backup strategy is a, is a good rule of thumb that I've um, been trying to encourage our graduate students to adopt, which is three co total copies of your data. So three copies, two of which are local but on different media, and so that's devices, um, and then one copy off-site. Now, in most cases, the off-site copy is going to be a cloud copy for most people, um, but that is not always viable, um, but I think in most cases that's the, the one copy off-site is going to be a cloud copy. The other thing with devices is to remember that um, thumb, thumb drives are notoriously unstable um, and not a really good way to, to a good second backup. Um, I encourage all graduate students whenever I do this to, to make sure they're investing in an external drive of some sort. Um, and I've, I always surprised the number of eyebrows that go up when I say, make sure you put an external drive. Um, but the 3 one backup strategies are a really great approach to this and thinking through storage. The next one is metadata content and format. Um, and so metadata became very common in our parlance after Snowden's, uh, the NSA and Snowden. Um, but really it was what is the data, that, what is the information that's going to help make your data understandable in the long term? That's the basics of metadata. Um, it could be a very basic data dictionary. Um, so I received a spreadsheet recently uh, and that was coded uh, with a one, two, three, but they didn't actually give me the data dictionary to tell me what the one, two, three meant. <laughs> so, um, having just that basic information to, to give context for it. And that's at the most basic level. If this could be something that's much where you're coding, recoding variables, um, but you need to explain what that is um, so people can understand it in the future. Often there are specific standards for specific researchers or specific communities of researchers and disciplines. Tulane has a really nice uh, 
website where they talk about the different schemas. Um, and you can see, are y'all seeing uh, metadata schemas? What page? Yes. Okay. So you can see here the various schemas that different disciplines use um, to document their data. And it may not even be understandable. What we use in, it may not be understandable if you're not within these fields. Um, within social sciences, we tend to use DDI. Uh, and it just is a basically a way of telling you which particular fields make sense for that particular discipline. Um, so some, in this case, it's mostly surveys. And this is what I'm most familiar with, is this, the DDI uh, metadata schema. But there are a lot of different ones that people may go into. Um, so knowing what your disciplinary practices would be is, uh, is critical. Um, and knowing how metadata is being captured. Um, is it being auto-saved? Is it something that you have to generate? Um, is it providing uh, the, can you easily extract it to create documentation? I know in REDCap you can create a survey and then extract it. Um, and that will create a data dictionary for you. Um, but thinking through what, what, is the pro what is the process for actually um, understanding your data in the long term. The next one is um, the, po or the policies for reuse, sharing, and access. And this is really critical for, um, um, for granting agencies. This is really why the data management plans were being created or being required is so that people had a method for or talked about a method for sharing their data in the long term. It doesn't mean that you have to or should share anything. Um, you, but they do want you to ask, what are your obligations for sharing? So if the grant requires that you share the data, what is it that they're requiring that you share? Um, or if it's that you are able to share, in most cases, a um, public use file that you're not necessarily going to be sharing your restricted access data, um, what are the details that you need to follow or the, the restrictions you need to follow in order to protect your data? Um, so what are the ethical privacy issues? What are the existing intellectual prop property or copyright issues? Is it somebody else's data set that they've created and you've merged it with your own? Do you have the right to do that? Um, what are the, who are the intended future users for the data? Um, so having an understanding, and this one's hard, I think, because sometimes people may come up with ideas for using your data that are outside of your field, so there's no way to think about them. But trying to think through um, what kinds of researchers might actually be future users of your data. And then finally, a preferred citation. Um, I'll show you some resources later on that will actually do this for you. So this one's become a lot easier to deal with. And there are some best practices for citing data. Um, but we are encouraging people to think about the citation um, and cite data appropriately. <laughs> um, it's not always been a practice that, uh, in, in social sciences, certainly. I, I'm not so sure about sciences, but <clears throat> a colleague of mine did a uh, an analysis of uh, several different social science disciplines through scholarly output and found that very few of them, this is back in 2010, very few of, the, of them at the time cited the data sets that they were using for secondary analysis, analysis in a way where they could actually be find, where other people could actually find that data set. Um, let me say that again. So they weren't citing the data set that they were using for their secondary analysis in a way in which, so that other people could find that data set. Um, they were using particular versions, um, but not citing that particular version or date uh, or unclear. Um, so we've been in the data community trying to promote data citation um, and the creation of data citations. Um, so that's why that one is part of this. And then we have the long-term preservation or archiving. Um, this one, I say preservation or archiving because uh, you not you don't necessarily have to archive your data for the long term, but you do need to be thinking about how you will preserve it. Um, so when it comes to preservation, for you as an individual researcher, um, what are the files that you want to store, and how do you have some kind of way or a system or plan in place that you will go back and actually create new versions or new formats of that data? What's most important of the things that you're collecting um, to ensure that they can be preserved over a long time? Um, I had a faculty member tell me that he every July 4th and January 1st was his day to go in and look at his data and clean it up and back it up. 
um, and see if the files were actually functionally, functional anymore. Um, so having some kind of plan, and I thought that was great because at least that way for long-term preservation, you don't need to be doing it um, all the time, but at least once a year or twice a year, going through and looking at your files uh, and getting a sense of what can be thrown away and what, or what can be, what's less important and what are the things that are high priority. Um, the, uh, in addition, if you do want to archive it, um, so if you want to make it available for the long term in an archive online, um, then you need to be thinking about those questions early on. Um, so there are a lot of archives out there now um, that some are, are, I'll talk about a little bit later, like ICPSR or um, Odom Institute that are available to archive your data. And it's, this is for uh, data that is extremely valuable, things that people spend a lot of money on or spend a lot of time with or that would have be of research interest. Um, and they will help you with that process. But the problem is, is that you, you do need to know what, what restrictions they have and what guidelines they have in place in order to archive it appropriately in the future. So if you aren't looking at ICPSR, if you want to archive something in ICPSR and you're not looking there to see what they require for that, you may not be able to archive your data there. Um, so having those guidelines in place or thinking, looking at those guidelines while you're creating a DMT would be very helpful. Um, ICPSR is a great place. Another place a lot of researchers have gone to recently is FigShare. Um, it is more of a user side archiving, so you're not giving your data over to, to in ICPSR's case, you're giving your data in, to, the, to the archive and they will manage it. Um, and it has a cost associated with it. Um, with something like Figshare, it isn't um, quite so, uh, there's no hands-on component to this. Have y'all used Figshare before or heard of this before? Okay, so it's a website where people, um, yeah, so you've used ICPSR. So Figshare is a website that people have used to archive their data in some cases and make it available. It's more for data that you're trying to make available publicly share with others. Um, but again, it's user side archiving. It's not the same kind of system as ICPSR. So the last part of this is the budgetary considerations. Um, what are the ante anticipated costs for short-term storage, storage? So how much server space or um, file space do you need? What do you think will be, and this is hard to estimate, but, but something that you should be thinking about, what do you think is the size going to be for your data as you're going through the project? Um, will one external drive hold most of what you're doing, or do you need several servers, or do you need a very large amount of um, space, right? Um, and what maintenance costs will go into that? Is this something for one person where you just will need to maintain it every year? You may have um, buy a new external drive every five years. Or do you need to actually buy someone who can maintain your servers? The other question that needs for budget, budgetary considerations is long-term archiving. Archiving has costs. It's not a free option um, in most cases. <clears throat> so ICPSR, uh, when they ingest your data, they will help get curate it. They will help go through it, make sure it will be understandable to others. Um, and then they will ingest it into their archive. Um, that, that has a cost because labor is involved with that. So for a lot of people, one of the things that in addition to building in um, but budgetary considerations for your actual project and the project, the data collection process, building in budgetary considerations for the archiving, for um, the storage, all of those questions would be, are, is critical. And they're going to expect in the DMPs that you'll have thought about those to some extent. Um, this could be difficult to do on your own, so definitely asking questions of both IT professionals and librarians and ICPSR or wherever you're thinking of archiving is, is critical, um, and doing that as far in advance as you can. Now, I'm going to go through, are there, well, I don't pause, are there any questions at this point? I know there are only two, oh, there's only one of us. <laughs> yeah, Beth had to wait for a conference call. Oh, okay. That's okay. Um, she made a comment that just said that, I don't know if you saw this, but, um, uh -huh. We have some data agreements that didn't, do not allow us to store data on our laptops. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was just more of a comment. But um, yeah, that's been the only one so far. Matt, do you have any questions? 
Okay. So the I'm just going to go through, through a couple of um, or a few tools and guides that I use that I think are really helpful for um, all different kinds of things. Um, the first one is DMP tool, and especially if you are going to be writing a, DM, a data management plan, um, this is a free tool. Let me get over to my um, website. So this is a free tool that will uh, actually let you look at the different requirements for different funders. Um, so it, uh, it it's a pretty, and it gives sample plans as well, which it, for some of them. Um, so it's a really nice resource for looking at the current requirements for different funders. In addition, the tool will allow you to uh, walk through, um, and you have to create an account, but it will allow you to walk through the steps of creating a data management plan. So just as how we have in um, my PowerPoint, presentation, those different steps, um, so it will walk you through those steps and allow you, give you space to actually create a, um, your own data management plan. So it's kind of a template tool for data management plans. Some cool schools, when they use this, uh, actually have embedded language that they require you to use. We do not do that here at MCG, but, um, but you might see that at other places. So that's the first one, just for giving guidelines on, um, oops, sorry. Uh, on data management, data management. The second one's Open Science Framework. I love this, and um, I just started playing around with it again. I have had a lot of friends who use this for conferences or other kinds of projects. Um, but Open Science Framework is a free website. Thanks, Sam, for putting in all my URLs. But, um, a free website uh, and uh, collaboration tool that allows you to share files across um, collaborators to, on a project. Um, and you can see here I have, uh, I created a, a space for um, data management outreach, and these are just my files um, related to data management Oops. outreach. Um, you can see you can integrate a lot of different tools. So one of the things that I integrated was Google Drive. Um, so you can integrate, in this case, it's readings on data management. Um, this is the storage area, so if you want to see the webinar, the webinar slides, you can go into this link and see the webinar slides. Um, you can also integrate to the tarot and a lot of other things. Under add-ons, you'll see Amazon's S3. So this is how people use it for data. Um, you put your data or your scripts in GitHub, um, for instance, or Figshare, and then you can share them through the collaboration, pro through the projects. Um, and you can keep these projects private um, if you wish to. This one is public so that you can see it. Um, you can tag the different projects. Um, yes, <laughs> it's a really great tool. Um, Suzanne was saying that she loves this. This is a really great tool. And again, a lot of conferences, a lot of collaborative projects have been using this, especially in the library world. And it's, it's free as well. Um, this is Figshare. I mentioned that one briefly, um, and it's, Figshare is nice because you can actually browse all the other projects to see what kinds of data are in here. I tend to use this for um, for people who are doing projects that are in newer areas, um, just to see what kinds of things are being done out there. But you can also create um, your own projects and, and upload your data in here, and it handles data sets pretty well. Um, I don't have any in here right now, but. Um, there's a couple of presentations in here. Just I was playing around with it, but a lot of people use it in the data world. Um, the this slide has a lot of different links you can go into, um, and I'll just go through each one of these um, really quickly. Um, my data site um, has a lot of links on it that I would encourage you to take a look at if you're interested. Um, Plus, the, almost any university now, especially the large ones, have research data services of some sort. And so there's a lot of tools and guidelines out there, such as this one from Minnesota, or Michigan, sorry. Sorry, Michigan. And then the next one is from Minnesota, which is not let me. I can't actually click on it because of WebEx is in the way. Here we go. Minnesota's um, ICPSR has some guidelines on how to archive data with them. Um, so definitely, if you're thinking about doing uh, archiving there, that would be one to look at. Um, and then there's this book called Data Management for Researchers, which is a wonderful resource by Kristen Briney on uh, all of these questions. She goes through the different components of a data management plan. 
uh, and talk about them in much more depth than I can do in a 30 minute, actually a little bit over 30 minute section. Um, but it is an ebook that we have at UNCG, so uh, I encourage y'all to read it if you do something you're interested in. And there's a couple other things on here. Uh, somebody asked about um, preserving archiving audio and video, so there's a link to the to NARA's best practices page for that. It has a lot of links out. And then a webinar on March 13th from Data One, which is one of the leading data management training uh, groups. Um, and they have a lot of tools and resources on their website, but they're also doing this webinar um, on March 13th. And then finally, um, for data management consultations, these are things that I can do, help people with. Um, I can definitely do re uh, review and provide feedback on data management plans. Um, typically looking at this from an archive, a long-term preservation and archiving standpoint. Um, the data workflow, uh, this is really fun for me, is thinking about through the different kinds of tools or um, that you could use for organizing your data or for the project materials that you have in your project. Um, providing feedback on documentation um, to ensure that it's optimized for sharing, if that's something you're interested in. And then, of course, my I've always provided data repository advice, so where do you want to or where should you or could you share your or archive your data? And then finally, if you have any questions, um, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, or if you want to make an appointment, you can book me at my calendar. So thank you. And Matt, do you have any questions or anything you're running into that you would want to talk through? Not to put pressure on that. While Matt's thinking, I have a question, um, but I think you kind of covered it. On that DMP tool, do they have templates for creating um, data mm -hmm. management plans? Yeah, so it is a template. It's um, Basically, all it is is a, a template in the sense that it gives you the questions that they'll ask you, and then they'll give you space for you to write out your data management plan. So it's, it's not that they give you um, sample language. Uh, it's just that they give you the the, um, the parts to the actual data management plan being used by that funding agency. Okay. So what you'll see in it is a um, you'll see the the text from the funding agency for a particular part to so say data storage, um, and then it'll give you some contextual information asking you a few questions, and then it gives you space where you can actually uh, copy and paste or input your information. And at the end, what it'll do is generate the, the final data management plan. So it'll put it all together in a PDF or a Word doc. Does that answer your question? Yes. That's very <laughs> useful. Yeah, it's actually, and it would be more useful. We don't have it set up this way at UNTG yet. Hopefully, some, I'm still trying to get this happen, but um, some institutions have put template language in there. Um, so their researchers are required, because when you go in, you'll see that you have to um, choose an institution, or it asks you to choose an institution, you don't have to. Um, and so if you, let me see if it'll go, yeah, they're good. Um, if you are at, you know, American University and log in through their institution, they may have their own language that they require that you use in your DMP. We do not do that at this point at UNCG. Maybe someday. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Linda. No problem. Thanks, Matt, for sticking around <laughs> and Sam for organizing. <laughs> and Beth for coming. Yeah. And as we said, it will be recorded and we'll send out the links. It usually takes me a couple days to process it. And Linda, just for your um, information, I will send you a link to the raw file if you want to edit it down okay. or use it in whatever you like. And I'll also, of course, send you the YouTube file. Okay. Sounds good. So, um, yeah, well, if that's it, I'm going to sign out. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll um, see you guys soon. All right. See you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.